I would like to talk a little bit about uh, um, some parts of the Internet of Things that usually we don't really think about. So uh, unfortunately, um, Gianluca was uh, supposed to speak about the parts of the Internet of Things that we usually think about, like the device embedded in your shoes or uh, the device embedded in your thermostat that connects to the network and does things. Um, the other parts of the Internet of Things that we have talked about today, automotive, uh, avionics, and now industrial control, are things that have been with us for a long time. So we don't really think of them as part of this wave of things that are getting on the network. But uh, as uh, I will show uh, in a little while, um, they are getting on the network. And this is going to create uh, um, issues. So um, I would like to start from one point that is very simple, and it has been made beautifully actually by uh, Andrea in his uh, very nice talk that I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, which is the fact that security is actually about managing risk. We, are not, we, we do not want to talk about security talking about how to design secure stuff. I see some of my students that say, oh no, here he goes again. I already, I already heard this many times in class. So, Security is about designing things that are secure enough for what they are doing. You cannot design a secure device. You can design a device that is secure enough for the things that it's going to do. Um, and so when we explore devices, we look at vulnerabilities, at the existence of vulnerabilities, but as Andrea said today, it's not like we want to achieve the non-existence of vulnerabilities. That is impossible. What we want to achieve is a state where acknowledging that there might be a vulnerability, we want to be able to A, find it as soon as possible, B, be able to patch it if it's dangerous, and C, and actually last but not least, C, be sure that this vulnerability, even if it's there, is not going to impact what the device is supposed to be doing or at least it's going to impact it in a very soft manner that does not endanger, for instance, human lives. So in order to understand the security of, uh, for instance, uh, cyber physical systems used in the industry, industrial control systems and robots, we need to go and try to understand not just how vulnerable they are, but how exploitable these vulnerabilities are. How this, how how are they are or they are not designed to be resilient in case a vulnerability is found, and also, last but not least, what are the threats that insist on these systems? So in order to do this, I want to check you with you four facts that are listed over there, but now I'm going through them uh, one after the other. So I'm not spending time on these slides, but I'm going through the facts one after the other. The first fact is that Cyber physical systems, such as industrial control systems, for instance, are critical systems. This is actually a thing that we think we know, but we don't really always think about it. So industrial control systems manage uh, the real backbone infrastructure of our civilization. Uh, today we have already heard about connected cars. But, and, and if you look at my slides, so it may be a little bit difficult to read from the, the, the uh, from back at the end of the class, but all of these slides, if you see the pictures from newspapers, they are dated before 2010. Because I went back and sought news that were as old as possible related to these issues, just to show that this is not a new issue. So this is in 2010. Somebody had the nice idea, I don't know um, if, uh, um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever discussed this with Eric, but this was the first uh, time I found uh, um, security device for cars, actually um, an anti-theft system for cars, that had a nice remote monitoring platform. This was just like the black boxes that you put on cars, satellite tracker, but these specific ones allowed you from the web application that tracked your, device, your, uh, your car, if your car had been stolen, you could go online and basically send an immobilizer signal and immobilize the car. The only issue was that the web application for this was broken, and so somebody was able to block 
a hundred cars. They stopped at a hundred. It was just a demonstrative hack on the driveways in the middle of the road in the city of Austin. They just chose Austin because reasons. So they chose 100 random cars in Austin, Texas, just to prove a point. Um, we had the problem with planes that uh, uh, Andrea was talking about. This is from 2009, uh, where, you know, planes are very secure. Fighter planes are very secure. They are not very connected objects. But if you have uh, um, a virus infection in the supporting systems that allow those planes to fly, you can have a whole battalion of, uh, of fighter jets grounded because of a computer virus. So these are the things that we had already talked about this morning. But there's also trains staying in the transportation industry. Um, this is uh, news from 2003 where a virus basically took down the signaling of the whole eastern coast of the United States for trains. So no trains for a day on the eastern coast of the United States. But the power grid is managed by computers. Industrial control systems manage the power grid. And those computers used to be very disconnected, very isolated. They used to be only on the network of uh, energy uh, grid operators. But with the smart grid concept, what we are doing is connecting computers that manage power stations, computers that manage the grid, computers, small computers in our households that manage delivery of power to our households. Because we want to be able to, for instance, if I have a modern house and I have solar panels on the roof and I'm not consuming energy because I'm not at home, I want my smart meter to be able to sell back that energy towards the grid. But this creates a two-way flow of power, not just from the grid to the household, but also from the household to the grid, which complicates enormously the engineering of the system. It requires, for instance, gathering data about how much energy is being introduced into the system as opposed to consumed from the system. And it requires algorithms that can smartly, for instance, reroute energy to different parts of Europe depending on the weather forecast. Because if all houses have their own solar roof, then it means that where there is sun, in, in particular in the winter, if there is sun, so there's no air conditioning need, and at the same time there is sun, in that area, power consumption will be lower. So you will need to reroute power towards other areas, or you will need to shut down a specific generator. And all of this is going to happen automatically. That's the second promise. And the second promise is that we have no humans in the middle. So. For those of you who are younger, um, this is a movie from 1984. It's called War Games. And it's kind of the first movie where there was somebody doing some damage by hacking into systems. I was actually the, one of the first movies to portray hacking in general. So for those who have not seen the movie, the movie is related to the United States putting their nuclear arsenal under control of this big computer and a kid talking over the phone with this computer from his own, own computer and convincing the computer to actually launch a nuclear strike. So, and that's what happens when you take humans out of, the, out of the loop. The machines need to be more safe and more checked because there's nobody to tell the machine, no, don't do this. And while that's just a movie, we have real world examples of that. One specific real-world example that is um, keen to me is uh, trading. Nowadays, uh, um, about 40% of the uh, share orders, so the trading in Europe, is algorithmic. It's computers trading. Five years ago, it was about 20%. In the US, it's about 37%. So what happens is this. Most trades happen at a very high speed because algorithms take those decisions. But those algorithms cannot realize if the input data is flawed. So what happens is that, for instance, if you, uh, as, as we all know, at least most people in this room probably have taken uh, control systems classes, if you have a control system that is a closed loop, there's nobody actually shaking it, it's just, just working on its own, 
one of the things that you are interested in is how stable it is if there is an impulse, if there's something that changes abruptly the input. Does it stabilize or does it diverge? That's a basic question. Now, most of these algorithms have not been designed by thinking about that. And the problem is that the loop in this case is not closed on the single algorithm, but it's multiple algorithms talking to each other. So when you have somebody hit the wrong button, and instead of selling a million, selling a billion of shares of a corporation, the price of those shares begin to tank because, of course, the computers try to find a buyer that wants to buy a billion of those shares by offering a lower and lower and lower price. As that index tanks, there's other algorithms that are looking and saying, oh, wait, uh, Apple shares are tanking. Then there's these other shares that are connected to Apple that probably are going to tank as well, because if Apple is tanking, there must be some specific sort of systemic thing on the new economy. There must be something there. So let's sell these shares as well to protect the value. Or maybe, is it, it is tanking, so let's buy it because it's tanking. I, I think it will bound up. So all these algorithms are going to implement some automatic decisions that were not thought for a scenario where somebody just had a fat finger and, and stroked one million or one billion instead of one million. And nobody has thought how these things interact with each other. So those are the examples. In uh, um, 2010, Deutsche Banks had a fat finger problem, and their own algorithms uh, traded on Japan's Board of Trade for a staggering $182 billion crash before somebody was able to stop the algorithms from selling the shares. In 2010 still, Dow Jones swung by hundreds of points in just 20 minutes because somebody sold one billion stocks instead of one million before somebody could stop it and say, no, 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 wait, old. This is not happening. It's not true. And then there is my all times favorite, this, this Norwegian trader, Mr. Larsen, that in 2007 discovered how a specific trader on the US markets was trading. So you reverse engineer their algorithm, and he basically well, not stole, gained $50,000 by trading against it. And the company using the algorithm went to court, sued them, and the judge said, well, you know, your failure, it just, you, you, were, you were playing poker and it was better than you, so <laughs> that's it. It says $50,000. That was actually, that was actually awesome. So why do I use algorithmic trading? Because this is all public and we know what happens on the smart grid or what happens on other types of control system, we rarely get to know. The systems are complex. So this is a snapshot from smartgrid.ieee.org. That is the IEEE portal of smart grid. And that's basically the publications, so scientific papers, technical reports, standards, which came out in the 30 days before I took this snapshot on smart grid. So in 30 days, there were like 300 publications on new ways of managing smart grid operations in one way or another. Now, do you think that these things have all been tested against each other? Because what's going to happen is that those things are going to be implemented by different people. Those different people are going to interconnect their network. And if you have not uh, taken notice, the uh, European Union has decided that to move towards a trading algorithm, a trading platform for energy. So soon, besides having interconnection between the devices in our home and the power grid, the power grid will be managed by stock trading energy. So there will be algorithms like those ones, uh, trading energy instead of trading stocks. What is going to happen when we connect all these things together? How stable is this thing? Because the power grid has been designed for ages. If you call one of my colleagues from the electrical engineering department, they will tell you that the power grid has been designed for ages to be stable 
from top down stable. You cannot take it down completely. It is designed so that it shuts down partially maybe, but it never comes down. It's designed to be stable. But if you're designing multiple algorithms and interconnecting them and letting them talk to each other and you don't know what they are doing to each other, that's not a stable system. Or rather, we don't know. And this is for Andrea. Uh, it's a comic from a few years ago with a guy opening up a laptop with a Bluetooth adapter and Windows saying, uh, new hardware found, Airbus A310. Do you want to install the drivers now? So, <laughs> but yeah, so interconnection, interconnection was also one of the themes that Andrea touched. So in the avionics world, they have ensured a proper partition of interconnection. They have ensured that you cannot reach networks that you should not be able to reach. They have uh, ensured that the touching points are certified. This is not something that we have been doing with industrial control systems at all. Um, then there is the threat, because security vulnerabilities are nothing if there is no threat. So this is an important part, and I think that uh, both uh, uh, Andrea and Eric briefly touched that on their presentation, mostly Eric, because we have been talking a lot about that. So if there is a vulnerability, but nobody is going to exploit it, that vulnerability is there, it should be solved, but it doesn't really create a risk. The risk raises the moment there is value to protect and somebody who wants to endanger that value. So let's take, for instance, the um, Miller and Valasek act that um, Eric uh, described, taking over a Jeep from remote. Scary act. Nicely done. Interesting. But if you want to kill somebody who's driving a vehicle, there's a gazillion more ways that are easier than that. So how impactful is that for that specific scenario of remotely killing someone? Maybe not very. Do we have threats against industrial control systems? Yes, we do. We see, for instance, uh, uh, campaigns of spare phishing. So, emails targeted to personnel into companies that carry payloads that are related to industrial control systems. And spare phishing, so the attempt of getting into a corporation specifically by targeting its employees, is probably the most rising threat that we have. It's not a computer-related threat, it's a social-related threat. And we see that keeping growing, and not only growing, but we see it becoming more and more targeted, and we see it attacking smaller and smaller organizations. This is one of the things that happens in Italy. So um, when you talk to an organization about cybersecurity, in particular about cybersecurity of our industrial complex, the usual response, the gut response is, but we are not big. We are a small industry. We are a small company. Who's going to target us? everyone. Because those small companies that represent our backbone, our industrial backbone, sometimes have very unique products that other people are very interested into. Or they have very, very strong competitors that cannot really cope with the Italian creativity and talent and may decide to cope with them in another way. The bar for being target of an attack is going lower and lower and lower. That's what this graph shows. Attacks against small and medium businesses growing in percentage. Nobody cares if you are not Microsoft or Bank of America or Fiat Chrysler anymore. You can be smaller and you're still going to be attacked because the cost for attacking is getting lower and lower. So this is uh, one of my favorite examples. On the top, there's a, a Chinese fighter, Chengdu J20. And on the bottom, there's the F-35. Rather, it's a prototype, the YF-23 by Northrop. Can you spot some interesting similarities, such as in the tail plane, which is basically the same aircraft? 
And Northrop was actually one of the first companies in the US to be penetrated by the so-called APT, aggressive Chinese state-run campaigns of penetration into industrial networks. It's suggestive. So it's not just about business, but we had examples of weaponized attacks against industrial control systems. One of the most famous or infamous is Stuxnet. Stuxnet was um, uh, malware that uh, propagating using some standard Windows vulnerabilities, but it carried an encrypted payload. And so um, some computer scientists spent a long time, really, looking at that payload and trying to figure out what it was. It turned out, after three months, it turned out that this payload in, uh, unencrypted itself only on a specific version of Windows, Windows NT, actually, and on a specific type of machine connected to a specific controller, industrial controller, by Siemens. This industrial controller was used by one and only one device, a centrifuge for separating uranium. And this device by Siemens was sold to one customer in the world, Iran. So Stuxnet was a weapon designed to unleash its potential only on one specific target. And not just that, it was a piece of beauty because it actually didn't like erase the operating system or destroy the centrifuge. That would have been too obvious. Centrifuges have an oscillation cycle. The malware will just change the oscillation cycle slightly so that the product would be non-distinguishable from the real one, but completely wasted at the same time. So this is what is happening in industrial control systems. Because industrial control systems are targets for state and non-state malicious threats. <clears throat> so Stuxnet was designed to sabotage Iran's nuclear facilities. If you want to know who has written it, you can just toss a coin. It's two kind of two possible powers in the world that could have. Then a few months later, People found out another, another malware, which was called Duku, which used some of the same software components as Stuxnet. It used a couple of zero days, so of, of, vulnerab of uh, attacks against vulnerabilities that were not known before this malware was found. This is actually very rare for malware to use zero days. Most malware uses known attacks that have may not, maybe not been patched by everybody, but usually it's very rare to find malware that uses zero days. It used to be very rare, actually. Um, and this malware was designed to collect, well, you know, documents that contain data on the Iranian nuclear program. And these documents somehow found their way into a United Nations report at the end. So that's. That's kind of a slippery slope, because the moment you begin to fight in cyberspace, um, you realize that fighting in cyberspace is kind of a real slippery slope where many people then feel authorized to do the same. Because after that, there came Flamer, which was an enormous malware that uh, would gather uh, intelligence and, you know, Usually, it's difficult to attribute cyber attacks. Those uh, painted in red are the only nations where a sample of uh, Flamer has been found. You want to know who has written it? It's kind of, you know. There's, if, if you want, if you are still not convinced, in that malware, there is a zero day. Now, all of my students, know and remember that when we talked about encryption, one, one thing that I said, and I've been proven wrong by this, by the way, is that usually an attacker will not attack the encryption system. It will attack everything, everything else, because creating, finding vulnerabilities in encryption 
is a difficult job that only a few top mathematicians in the world can do. So this malware contained a zero day, a cryptographic zero day. And now you don't need to toss a coin to know who can have done that. Because there's only one organization in the world that employs all those mathematicians. So this is, this is what we think about when we think about securing, if we think about securing uh, our industrial backbone. It's not just the threat of economic operators competitors, data thieves. There's also the states. Some of our companies, some of those industrial control systems control critical systems that would be in the first line in the event of a war. And that's the one thing about militarization of cyberspace that we actually warned governments and agencies about and we weren't listened to. Because cyberspace it's called space, but it's not space. That's Gibson's fault, calling it a space. It's not a space. It's a set of infrastructures owned by private people. When you fight a war in a domain, domains of war, traditional domains of war are land, sea, space, air. These are not owned by private people. You establish superiority, military superiority on those, but they are not owned by private people. They are pretty international things. But when you switch to cyberspace, cyberspace is private. Not most of it, all of it. It's held up and run by infrastructure, run by private people. When they talk about cyber war, what they are talking about is war inside our own homes and companies which is what happened here. And then what happened is that other people from the other side decided to write uh, uh, another, another malware called Shamoon that uh, erased 30,000 uh, workstations at Saudi Aramco, short, stopping short of actually uh, damaging their production networks, but still. Um, so I think that we have gone through these four facts. Critical infrastructures, no humans in the middle, complex networks of complex systems whose behavior we don't really know that much, threats from state and non-state actors that aim at those systems. Now, enter the Internet of Things. Um, what is the Internet of Things? It's the Internet of everything that actually has processing power and connectivity. Airplanes, cars, personal things like Bluetooth, toothbrush. I don't know if you have seen this. I saw that in a shop in the US. Basically just downloads the data and it can, you can gamify the experience of your child learning to brush their thief. So you, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, there was nothing like that. They just taught me to actually brush my teeth, and they still do. Um, nowadays, apparently, you need to have a Bluetooth toothbrush that actually transforms everything in a game, and probably it kind of connects with Pokemon Go in some way. I, <laughs> and you can brush the Pokemon's teeth or something like that. Um, we have our personal devices on us. Our personal devices are interesting. If a few years ago, like five years ago, maybe six, I'd asked to someone, okay, so I would like to put a GPS tracker on you, and in, in return for me knowing every time of day and night where you are and what you're doing, I can tell you when you need to leave to go to your next appointment. They would have called like 911 or Cento di Ciotto in Italian and, and brought me to the hospital because I was obviously delirious. That's what we do right now. Um, so there's a, number, there's a number of personal devices that are on the Internet of Things and that connect to each other to exchange data. 
there's a number of own things that connect with those. So, for instance, you have your threads that can tell you if your milk is going spoiled and can connect to Amazon for ordering with Amazon now another carton of milk. Now, all I need is a way for the Amazon delivery person to actually place the milk in my fridge without me knowing, and I'm done. I can just arrive home, and the fridge has taken care of ordering food for me. Which is, on the one hand, pretty cool. On the other hand, it creates a battalion of devices, such as fridges, that are not used exactly by computer science uh, experts that will need to be maintained. There was a picture of a fridge running Windows 10 that was going around on Twitter the other day, and I was kind of scared about that. Uh, dishwashers, uh, other appliances, um, lights, mood lights that you can control. So if you have had a very bad, email, very bad day at work, your assistant that reads your emails and knows by the tone of your emails that you have had a very bad day at work will prepare for you a soothing music and some lower lights when you are enter home. And if you are not very careful about that, it will also connect to a dating app and get you somebody to wait you at home as well. So um, we have also medical things that connect to the internet. I was uh, called earlier this month, uh, well, actually late past month, in, uh, um, in Orlando to the, EM, uh, to the uh, EMBC, which is the Conference on Engineering, Medicine, and Biology, because for the first time, they had a track that related to cybersecurity. They wanted to know something about cybersecurity. It was, it was planned to be a very small track, and we actually overflowed the room. It was at the 8 in the morning, so I was like expecting to be there alone, just, you know clicking from my slides, and instead it was like packed because everybody kind of understood that this is one of the grounds that they need to break. Because these things are not just monitors, there's also pacemakers and insulin pumps on that pictures, and they actually interact with your body. This is actually more scary than everything else they've shown until now. And also, of course, which is the tour topic of my presentation, industrial things. Uh, robots, controllers, um, actuators, and sensors of all sorts. And we have done this, like having industrial control systems that were piloted by computers, for ages, 30 years. They were called numerical control machines once upon a time. Fact is, when you sold these machines uh, 20 years ago, the computer that controlled the machine was a part of the machine. You would not get that computer under IT control. That computer would be under the control of the operators of the machine, of the engineer that designed the industrial production line. It was a part of the machine. When you look at a robot, even now, most robotics experts are not necessarily computer scientists. They are because they are trained in the same universities and they take many of the same courses. But that's not how they see themselves. They are experts of robotics. They program the robot. The fact that within the robot there is three computers that interact in a certain way with a network or whatever else is not important from their point of view. So since all of these things are things and not computers, and people do not think of them as a computer, but as a thing that does some smart stuff, it's unsurprising that when you go to OWASP, which produces these lists of vulnerabilities that they found in things, web applications, normal applications, mobile applications, and recently they produced this top 13 of IoT vulnerabilities. Now, if you just do with me the exercise of closing your eyes for IoT and you look at this list, this list could be the list of vulnerabilities of any other system 25 years ago. Because the top vulnerability is the ability of username enumeration. Really? 
haven't we, I mean, this is literally described, how to avoid this, is literally described in the documents of Multics. In 1976, they solved this problem. It's 2016. Weak passwords. Who has ever heard of this problem before? Account lockout. Most of the IoT devices do not do proper account lockout, so you can brute force the accounts, even if the account does not have a, have a weak password, you can brute force the account because it doesn't lock you out. How long have we known about this? So why doesn't it care about locking out? Because usually, you would not be able to connect through the internet to a robot. So nobody cared if the password of the robot was weak and if somebody could brute force it. Because nobody would be there brute forcing it. If they were there, it would mean that somebody literally walked into your industrial plant and connected to the robot. You had bigger issues than the weak authentication password. But now, those robots are going to be placed on the internet. And so these things become important. Most IoT devices do not use encryption. It's 2016. Snowden, anyone? People are listening. There was this beautiful t-shirt that said, um, dance as if nobody is watching, write your email as if everybody is. Right. So, no, no IoT devices, or very few of them, use two-factor authentication, which has become slowly the standard for most. I mean, you have two-factor authentication for your fa Facebook profile and not for controlling industrial robots that we like two tons. Poorly implemented encryption. Updates, firmware updates sent without encryption. Update locations writable so that you can place the update there yourself. And so this is actually kind of the most serious vulnerabilities that can, I can think of, right? You can update the firmware of the device. If the device is an industrial robot that weighs two tons, there's a lot of things that you can do updating that firmware. Um, so if you are curious, we basically tested some of these things, I let the others, you read the others, but some of these things we tested on several industrial robots from primary brands. Cannot name the brands, but uh, the disclaimer by Andrea applies, but. So this is what we found on each industrial robot that we tested. That's what we found. So, the fact that you can design a device that is an industrial device and forget about checking that the firmware update that you are uploading into it is maybe signed by someone, it's not an excusable thing nowadays. In this day and age, even phones check that updates are signed. Well, phones worth having, so no one's right, but um, if even phones check that the dates are signed, how can possibly an industrial control system that costs ten thousand, tens of thousands of years, or an industrial robot that costs hundreds of thousands, can forget about checking that the update actually comes from the factory and not from somebody else? So what are the specific issues here that, that come up in Industry 4.0? Well, the main, in, the main specific issue is a specific issue that we have already seen happening, which is the opening up to the internet of systems that were not designed for it. We have seen this over and over again, and we are seeing it's like a nightmare. Being a security expert and being in the field for like more than 10 years, maybe more than 10 years, um, it's actually like a nightmare. You see the same thing happening over and over again, and you are unable to stop it. So this is happening over again. 
you opening up the systems that were not designed for it means that, for instance, you designed the robot so that it was secure until it was connected to its closed factory network. And then, one day, you wake up and you discover that somebody has created an app store for robots and wants you to connect from the panel of the robot to the app store and download the apps on your industrial robot that keeps weighing two tons, as if it were like your cell phone. Which is not by itself a bad idea, necessarily. It's actually a great idea to have a robot connect and download software to improve its capabilities. But the problem is that this implies that the robot is connected to the internet. So all of the assumptions of closed world that we made is not there anymore. Has anybody redesigned those things? Because when we opened up several industrial robots, we found out that the robots that came out in 2015 and the robots that came out in the 1995 have the same architecture because they are evolutive. They didn't redesign them. They just evolved them. Then there's another thing that happens with cybersecurity in the industry 4.0. And this, what happens is the potential impact on environment and on humans. Now, of course, all of the things that we have talked about today have a potential impact, harmful impact on humans. Cars, there's humans inside usually. Uh, Airplanes, there's a lot of humans inside there. And below them, actually. But, so for instance, nowadays, so this is a typical example of production line and, of, of robots in an industrial setting. The thing that you see around, the cage that you see around, is a safety measure. Those robots move very fast. If somebody opens one of the doors of the cage, the robots either stop or slow down to a very, very slow speed so that they are safe to, to get close to. It's a, it's a built-in mechanism. It's a built-in safety mechanism. This is how traditionally factory floors are organized. But nowadays, uh, you have robots that are designed to be cooperative, to work in front of a human. They are designed to be nice. They look nice because they, they need to give you confidence. And they are designed not to harm you. There's a lot of careful design in not letting those things be harmful. But this design is implemented in the software that runs on their systems. Some of it is implemented directly in the engines. So for instance, uh, that uh, robot is actually one of the most nice in, in the, its category. It's called Yumi. It's just you and me. And Yumi cannot really generate a force that is enough to seriously create damage to people because it's designed to work along them. So physically, it cannot. But it is true only in certain directions. So each motor can only be genera generating a certain amount of force. But the combination of those forces and of those speeds can only be computed via software. You cannot enforce it mechanically. So what happens if that software is redesigned by somebody else? Or if those safeguards are removed? Now, of course, what we need to wonder is also who can be interested in doing that? What other things could somebody be interested in doing to a robot? Because if this robot is cooperative and it connects to the internet, then that's a very different uh, security setting that a robot that was not cooperative and disconnected from the internet. These two things are different. But inside them, there's the same architecture and actually the same software with differences, of course, but the same type of software. Lack of updates. Because all we think about when we think about security in the in internet world is updates. You keep your cell phone updated, you keep your apps updated, you keep the applications on your computer updated, you let Windows update try to update your system and fail miserably. But jokes aside, the addition of automatic updates on Windows has been one of the major security advances 
for the masses of the last 10 years. That's what avoided a lot of explosive, for instance, worms on the internet, or reduced the possibilities of those. We don't have updates and vault management processes for industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are, A, not managed by IT people, so they don't even understand the need for patching. B, those systems have the lifetime of the industrial system they are connected to. There's a lot of Windows and T3.5 systems that are managing machines around the world. And guess what? They are not getting updated or substituted anytime soon, because until the machine does not break down irreparably, that's an investment that you want to keep running. We don't even know how to patch those systems. We don't even know what vulnerabilities those systems have. If you ask me, how do I connect this very old system to a network that is open to the internet in such a way that it's reasonably secure, my only honest answer can be, I don't know. You need to keep it separated from the internet because the moment you connect it, I cannot help you. And that's a very bad answer for me to have. And also, actually, on most of these devices, you find coding practices that really date from the last century. So any person that has tested the security of system knows that nowadays, basic memory management errors are really rare to find in code. Most code is nowadays designed with languages that do not really let you manage your own memory. And there's a lot of safeguards built around those. So it's, it's rare that nowadays you find a Stack Overflow vulnerability that is pure and simple, as the ones you can find in controllers because they are simpler. They don't even have an operating system sometimes. They just have some code that has been cobbled together in C by somebody who is not a programmer. So there's a good part about this. The good part is this that if ever Skynet comes to life, I know it's not going to win anytime soon. But of course, if Skynet comes to life, you will see Terminators running behind myself, Eric, Andrea, and several other people in this room. Um, so what I was getting at is that we have vulnerabilities here that are actually different genetically from other vulnerabilities. In cyber physical systems, we have vulnerabilities that arise not from the digital system itself, not from the physical system itself, but from the interconnection of the two. And the problem is that while we do have ways to understand and manage digital vulnerabilities, we don't have ways to actually understand the impact of vulnerabilities that mix these two things. This is, an under, this is a fundamental science lack of understanding that we have in our field. Um, so I, will, I am just running over time, so um, I will just leave the time for questions. Um, I thank you for having listened to me. If you want to reach out to me, that's my email address, or you can tweet at me. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the, this slide contains an XKCD cartoon that I particularly like. Uh, there's a guy pulling a lever, gets bolted by uh, lightning, and then there's two possible outcomes. The normal person says, whoops, maybe I shouldn't do that again. And the scientist says, well, let's see if it happens every time. <laughs> and that is me. <laughs>